hope is misplaced, right? They're placing it in government and people and people in government, and that's just never a good idea. More lighthearted example of misplaced hope. So, you know, years ago, I used to watch football. I haven't watched any football this season. I like football, but I don't like the politics in football right now, so I'm just not watching it in America, yeah. So, born in Colorado, Broncos fan. Anybody testify? You got a Packers fan back there. I'll take you. The rest of these weird Lions people. I like Aaron Rodgers. Cool guy. I don't know him, but I mean, he seems cool. So, Broncos, a few years back, actually many years back now, went to the Super Bowl. It's like, yes. I was so confident they were going to win this thing. For weeks, the anticipation, the hope was building. It's going to be the most epic win ever. Thought they had it in the bag against the Seahawks. They got crushed from the opening snap. Super bummed. I was sad. Was I not sad? I was sad. I really thought they'd win. My hope was misplaced, one, because I really thought they were going to do it, and then, two, I was putting way too much importance on a game that adults are paid millions of dollars to play. And anytime those things go together, don't put a lot of hope in it, okay? Because it's just not where your hope should be. But I, I bring up all this stuff to say, one, pray for me, because, um, yeah. And then, two, our hope is easily misplaced. Easily misplaced as people. Often, we put our hope into things that we cannot control. I cannot control what whoever is in the White House decides to do. I cannot control the outcome of a sports game that these pros are, but I can't control that stuff, right? And other times we put our control or our, our hope into things that we can control, right? We think like, man, if I can just nudge it this way, things I can control, we place our hope in it, right? Like maybe you're really, really placing a lot of hope in having good grades so you can get into a good college and have a good career. There's a lot of hope riding in that. Maybe you've got a lot of hope in your sports performance, so you can do well, you can get a scholarship, your hope is there. Maybe it's hope in that relationship. Just when I have that person, everything's going to be so much better, right? You hear that, you see that, you do. And it's like, man, that hope is so misplaced, you are just going to be crushed. Placing, maybe you're hoping like one day when I'm whatever, one day when I graduate, one day when I do have that job, one day when I'm married, one day when I've achieved enough or done enough or I'm so far in life then, right? It's if then, it's conditional, our hope being in those things. And while there's nothing wrong with good grades or education or sports or God-honoring, Christ-centered dating relationships when you're both whole and complete in Christ first, you grabbing me on this? Okay. Nothing wrong with looking to the future for what God has for you. They can't be our source of hope. It can't be what we put all of our stock into in there because there will come a time if your hope is in those things where those things will fail you. Those things will let you down. Either you're going to accomplish them and realize pretty quickly it's not what you thought it was going to be. It's not your savior. It's not the end all because you're trying to fill a place that God should be in. Or if those things aren't accomplished, if those things don't happen, the situation feels worse because you put so much banked on that. And that's some of what we're seeing culturally right now on, on some of the divide is people are putting their hopes so much in humanistic things that when it's not happening or not happening the way they think it should be, hopes are crushed on both ends. And it's because that hope is misplaced, which means our hope has to be put into something that is unshakable, something that is certain. Our hope has to be more than wishful thinking. It has to be rooted in truth. Our hope has to be rooted in that truth. And last week you guys were here, right? We started a series called Unstoppable. You guys remember what the first message was? Anybody? You guys awake? Truth. Yes. <laughs> Caleb's awake. And I know because his sunglasses are off. He's awake. Truth, right? Unstoppable truth. That was last week's message. Reason for that is out of truth comes hope. And that's what we're building this message on tonight. And really, we serve an unstoppable God. He is unstoppable. Even when things seem impossible, He is greater. Through Him, there's unstoppable things that will happen in our lives as followers, some things that need to be in there. So with us talking last time about truth being absolute, truth being authoritative, truth being necessary in our lives as followers of Jesus, this week as we talk about 
continuing in that vein, that, that truth being unstoppable, out of that unstoppable truth comes an unstoppable hope, a hope that is resolute, a hope that is based on the very character of God, hope based in who he is, an unshakable, unstoppable hope. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you will be the center of what we do tonight. Holy Spirit, as we get into your word, I pray, God, that you will help us to unpack this. God, I hope that it won't fall on deaf ears. God, that this will soak in and that that students and leaders will grab this, that our hope has to be based in you. So, Lord, be with us tonight. It's in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. If you have your Bibles, open up to John chapter 8. Fourth book of the New Testament, John chapter 8, written by John. Don't overcomplicate scripture. John, one of the disciples, one of the three closest to Jesus. A lot of great stuff in this entire book. We're actually going to be hopping through a lot of scripture tonight. So if you have something you're taking notes on, write down those references, go through them later. They will be on the screens as well. And if you can turn to it in time, then turn to it in time. But John chapter 8. 31 through 32, our text verse, says this, To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So what truth do you think Jesus is referring to here? Right? He says, you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. Well, it tells us right there, if you're really my disciples, if you hold to my teachings, then you'll know what the truth is. He's establishing that he is truth, that the things he say are truthful, that he is who he says he is. And in the context of this passage, it was talking about who is Jesus. Some believed that he was a prophet. Some believed he was a good man. Some believed that he was the Son of God and the Messiah. Some believed he was just a moral teacher. So he's asking that question. They're clarifying this. Who, who am I? And Jesus is like, I am the truth. All of the book of John works through this vein. In fact, the beginning of John in the book in John 1 references Jesus as the very Son of God, the Messiah, the only one who would bring true, lasting hope. And the rest of the book is built on that truth. And so we see that theme come up throughout here. And this passage is telling us and those who were listening at the time that Jesus is king, that he is the promised Messiah. He is the one that the Jews were hoping for. He is the one that us today put our hope in for salvation because there is no other way. Knowing the truth of who Jesus is and what he came to do is really what this is out about. And that's where that hope comes from. And through that hope, we find freedom. So the first thing I want to get to you guys tonight is that hope is rooted in truth. Hope is always rooted in truth. Now, knowing truth is more than just a simple statement. It's more than just being able to express it. It's, it's understanding it. It's getting it into our hearts. It's getting into the Word of God. It's knowing what He promises, what He teaches It's loving what he loves and hating what he hates. But in order to know that, we have to, and able to do that, we have to know what that is. It's how we begin to understand the heart of God and his character is by getting into the word. It's also how we understand what he says is going to happen, what's coming down the pipeline, what we can hope for in the future. We want to place our hope in Jesus. We have to know what he's even all about in the first place. Hope is rooted in truth. And when we look at our world, when we look at the crazy stuff going on, we can filter that, the current events, through Scripture. We see what's going on lived out because the Bible is telling us what's going to happen, and we're seeing it. Write down these references. So Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Jude, just the entire book of Revelation. Then you can throw Daniel in there if you'd like. These Books are all talking about things that are to come. Many of these things are happening now. They're telling us about the return of Christ. They're telling us how things are going to be leading up to that, and we're seeing it happen. And the reason we know it's happening is because it was written about. It's not like it's happening right now, and they're like changing the words and writing it down to fit. This stuff was talked about thousands of years ago, and it is happening today, right? Because the Word of God is authoritative. It is truth. And out of that truth 
comes hope. I share this because if you dive into this stuff later, it's going to encourage you. You're going to be like, whoa, the Word of God. Like, we're literally living out what Scripture is talking about right now. It's a crazy, awesome time to be alive. There's so many parts that Scripture talks about of what we're experiencing. And we see in these passages, Jesus is coming back. He will establish his kingdom in a new heaven. That's the end goal. Hope is rooted in knowing the truth. Because it's easy to look out there and see all the garbage and be like, man, it's hopeless. It's hopeless. We can feel like that pretty quick. Our hope can be misplaced. We feel let down. But when we know what the truth is, right, the absolute truth that Jesus is king, that he is returning, it changes how we view all of the stuff that's happening. Right? Think of it as an encouragement. We're not left here to just suffer, to just figure it out on our own. He has promised us a future hope. Give you some background here. If you go to Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 through 5, background is after everything has happened. Okay, and what I mean by that is rapture of the church, tribulation, seven years of literal crazy worst things we've ever seen, followed by battle of Armageddon, physical return of Christ to earth, where he annihilates the forces of evil and establishes a thousand year called the millennial reign. At the end of that is what this passage is talking about. It's the hope that is to come. When we're found in Jesus, this is what we get to look forward to. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? That's the hope we have in Jesus. That's what's to come. See, when we have hope in what's to come, when we know what the outcome is, it changes things. Why do you think that communist, socialistic government structures, one of the first things they do is restrict or ban religion, Christianity specifically? Because it brings hope. And you're like, wait, you said communism, socialism. Okay, quick history lesson, those two are the same thing, all right? Socialism, communism, that's how they always come in and set up. And you'd be like, well, there's some places, like, they allow the church, right, or the church flourishes under. You don't understand, like, it brings persecution. The word of God is restricted. When Christianity is allowed in places like this, what happens is the government tells them what they can speak on. So it's these feel-good, fluffy messages that don't ever change someone's life. Evangelism, conversion of someone is illegal, you can go to jail or be sentenced to death for it. What they do is they water it down, right? They limit the truth that you hear. Or they just make it completely illegal. Why is that? Because the truth brings hope. What happens when people have hope? They stand up for it, don't they? When you don't want to lose power, what do you do is you crush hope. That's why these nations that want to keep power make Christianity restricted or illegal. They want to keep their power. They see it as a threat because it's no longer about them. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more, as you see the day, capital D, meaning day of the Lord, the return of Christ, approaching. It's telling us to hold tightly to this hope, unswervingly, unwaveringly. It's this hope that scares others who want to have power. It's this hope that people want to suppress because it is an absolute authoritative truth that brings this hope. It's unstoppable. And we hold tightly to this hope because he, meaning Jesus, who promised it, is faithful. This hope is rooted in truth, and this truth in Jesus is unstoppable. This is why when we have this hope, we can get through anything. 
You guys following? All right, just making sure. Second thing, hope gives strength. When we know the truth, right, hope comes out of that truth. When you know the truth, it provides hope, but that hope also gives us strength, and that's a little bit of what I was just talking about. Have you ever had something that was just so hard to get through? You're like, oh, my gosh, I can't do it. And it's like you're just trying to get out of bed in the morning. That's like me most mornings. Like, I can't do it. I hate my alarm. It seems impossible. You're spent. You have nothing more to give, right? Except another snooze hit. You're like, snooze. <sighs> and then what happens is you know it's almost done. Or you know it's like if I wait any longer, it's going to be like, I'm not going to make it on time. So then you drag your carcass out of bed. But what happens, right, is when you see it's almost done, you get this little glimmer of hope, you get this this sudden burst of energy, right, this renewal of energy, right? You guys feel this in the summer or like during quarantine, you're like, I'm so bored and I just can't get off this couch and I've only been on my phone for 12 hours today. Ah." And then all of a sudden, like, one of your friends shows up, and you're like, I can't even move. And then they show up, and you're like, oh, yeah, let's go hang out. And you've got all this energy all of a sudden, right? All of a sudden, it's hopeful. You guys been there? Okay. A few years back, Mandy and I went hiking in Tennessee while we were down there. And we've done this a few times, and we were like, man, let's try out some new places. And so there was this one, sounded really cool, sounded really awesome, nice and enjoyable, called Rainbow Falls. Looked up Rainbow Falls, and it was listed as an intermediate intermediate hike, but what I found out is it's actually not. Um, Rainbow Falls turned out to be a lie. It was not rainbows and sunshine. It was painful, okay? It's a a five-and-a-half-mile round-trip hike, which isn't the bad part. There was a 1,640-foot increase in elevation, upward. And you're like, I've gone further than that in an elevator. Okay, this is listed as difficult. Difficult. I didn't realize this. The website lied. I saw one that said intermediate, and I'm like, let's do it. I didn't look at the rest. It was my mistake. This is rugged terrain the entire way up. There was no reprieve from the incline. In fact, we have a picture of it, I believe. That's the trail. The picture doesn't do justice. Like, you've seen Lord of the Rings when, like, Gollum leads him to the stairs, and he's like, the stairs, the tunnel, where it's this. It's like, it's like that. We're like, like crawling up. And, you know, we had like water with us and granola bars. They were gone in like 20 minutes, like drinking out of a river. I'm not even joking. This happened, okay? And the whole way up, and I'm like, I'm trying to be positive for Mandy. She's like, I'm going to die. And I'm like thinking inside, I'm going to die too, but at least we'll die together. But I'm like, you can do it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to die. And then we would see people coming down, and they're like, yeah, like all happy. And I'm like, how much farther? And they're like, this saddened look on their face of like, and then they're in the south. They're like, oh, hun, it's a long ways. And we're like, Lord Jesus. We finally get closer. You can hear the waterfall. You can feel the mist. You're like, there actually is a fall up here. <laughs> okay, cool. And then you ask someone, you see someone coming down, how much farther? And they're like, you're almost there. And you're like, yes, I can do this. Because you're thinking of turning back this whole time. I can just roll down this hill. I don't even need to walk it. It might hurt a little bit, but at least I'll get to the bottom. That's the thought. And then you get to the top, and you're like, man, we made this. We did this. Because as you get close to the end, people tell you, you're almost there. You can do it. It brings hope. Because you know what's to come. It brings that strength. And in fact, when we got to the top, if you ever get to Tennessee, and you're feeling strong, and you're like, I'm going to take on Rainbow Falls. The waterfall is not that impressive at the top. It really isn't. It was kind of a letdown. So we renamed it the Devil's Hangnail. That's what we call it now. And the way down was so much better because we knew we were through the worst of it. It was hopeful. Right? And there's these people. They're like huffing up and they're like, how much further? And we're like, oh, it's just a little bit further. And they're like, oh, you could see the strength renew. And then the further we got down, people are like, how much further? And it's like, hun. <laughs> You might as well turn around now. It's getting dark. (laughs) You know, I don't want them to be, like, stuck up there like mountain rescue or something. Because, I mean, they have bears and stuff. And, yeah. It's easier to continue knowing it's not much farther, right? And we saw a lot of people. We'd tell them, we're like, it's a ways. And they're like, and they just turn around, you know, and, like, give up. Like, no joke. The same is true, though, with hope. 
Hope gives us strength to keep going and not quit. Even when things are difficult, when the path is hard, when we don't understand it or get it, it gives us strength because we know there is an end. Hope gives us strength because we know it's not on our ability, it's not on our power. We know the truth, right? Capital T, absolute truth. We know who Jesus is. He gives us the strength to get through. This is why we see crazy things in history that people have gotten through because of Jesus. In fact, if you want some light reading, there's a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. It goes from the early church, so time of Christ, up until about the 1970s, of those who are martyred or laid down their life for the faith. And many of these people died horribly horrific deaths and praised God all the way through it, knowing their hope is in Jesus, that this world is temporal, not compromising the absolute truth. Hope gives us strength by empowering us to get through what we're facing because we're fixing our eyes on what truly matters. Ephesians 1, verses 18 through 21 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, right, what we're fixing our eyes on, may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he, speaking of Jesus, has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance to his holy people. And in his incomparably great power for us who believe, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand from the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. The eyes of your heart being enlightened so you may know the hope that you can have through Jesus. His name is the highest. His power is the greatest. There is none like him. And this power is what brings hope, a hope that gives strength. And this is a present hope, so what you're walking through now, but also a future hope. It's twofold. It's an unstoppable hope because it's rooted in him, not us. Next thing, hope brings freedom. Hope brings freedom. What I mean by that is there's freedom knowing that hope is on the way, that God is providing strength, that there is an end that will come, even if we can't see it, and there's a peace that comes with that. It doesn't change the hard things you're going through, but it changes the perspective. We know difficulties are going to come. We know what's going to happen. Scripture tells us, but the hope is that we can get through it on his strength, and there is freedom to know that Jesus is still king. He is still in charge. He still sees our circumstances. He still works miracles. He still loves the lost. He is still returning. He is still true. He is still with us. He is still all-powerful, and he is very much alive and working. We serve a God that's not dead. He's very much alive, and there is freedom and hope that we find through Jesus. In fact, Romans 15, 13 tells us, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's in that hope, it's in that truth that we find freedom. Freedom given to us from Jesus. Nothing we've conjured up, nothing we've created, hope given to us through Jesus. It's freedom from sin and bondage, freedom from eternal damnation. That separation from God, it's freedom from guilt and shame. This is all available through Jesus to those who call upon his name, those who begin to live for him. It's hope that brings freedom, and that freedom is found in Christ alone. And I love how this passage tells us that this hope is found through God, right? How it says, may the God of hope. And it goes on to tell us that that can overflow through us, not fill us a little bit, overflow up and out of us. Love that picture. And we find areas in your life, if you search your heart, areas that aren't free, that are being held captive by whatever you're walking through. Those can be set free through Jesus. He is an unstoppable God who brings an unstoppable hope. The last thing for us tonight as we begin to wind down is that hope is not dead. We serve a God who is alive and active. He is still moving and working in this world and in our lives, and it's the living God that brings hope 
into our lives. He is very much alive. And it's easy to look at situations and circumstances and be like, there's no hope there. It's dead. It's gone. It's a lost cause. I don't see that when I see God. Because we serve a God of resurrection, right? What does that mean? To resurrect something means it had to have been what? Dead. Dead's kind of like the done. You guys realize that? Like, that's just, mm. God, he's just like, whatever. Come out of that grave, right? Conquered death. Raised people from the dead. There's nothing too far gone for God. So whatever issues you're facing that seem dead and gone, you serve a God of resurrection. In fact, he does some of his best work in dead things. You are dead to your old self if you are found in Christ. That's a good work. That's a good thing. Because we don't want to be alive to the old self because that means we're dead to Christ. We want to be alive in him. He does his best work, sometimes through what seems to be loss. Romans 5, verse 1 through 5 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character Hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Get that. God's love poured into our hearts that hope and faith become alive through what were seemingly bad things, those sufferings, but persevering through, right? That strength that He brings. And it's through that relationship with Jesus that we find this very unstoppable hope. Romans 8. 22 through 25, we know that the whole of creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. What this is talking about is what Jesus has promised us, what is to come. It's the hard times that maybe you're going through now or the ones that will come. It's in those eagerly awaiting, right, hoping for Jesus to do what he said he's going to do. That adoption into sonship talks about us being brought in as God's children. When we are found in a relationship with him, he sees us as sons and daughters. When there is a day when that is completed, when that is perfected, when we stand before him and he opens up his arms and he invites us into his kingdom everlasting, that is the hope. The flip side of that is apart from him, there is no way into heaven. Scripture is clear that it's only through Jesus, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Apart from Jesus, we cannot enter into heaven. We cannot. Eternally, we're sent to a place of suffering, a place not created for humans. And you may think, why would a loving God do that? I think, why is a person who has the knowledge of what truth has ever choose that? God doesn't send anybody there. It's our own choices and rejection of him that sends us there. Because God is just and holy. He can't ignore our sin and our defiance. It's our own doing. God's given us hope. He's given us truth so we may choose to be with him. The only way to right standing with God and through this eternal life is through Jesus. That's why he came and without him we see it's different. In fact, Scripture tells us that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. But there is always hope. And it's this, if you confess with your mouth, this is Romans 10, that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. It's that inward change. It's that death to self so we may live through him. And it all starts with the truth that Jesus is who he says he is. It's choosing to live for him. And then the hope is that our sins are forgiven and we have eternal life with him. Why do we hope in this? Because we know it's truth. How do we know it's truth? We know it because scripture says it and scripture is absolute authoritative truth. If you question me on that, listen to last week's message or we can chat after and I'd love to help you out with that. You see how these build. 
Truth brings hope. And it's the hope in Jesus that gets us through. If everybody bow their head and close their eyes and here as we close tonight, I want to ask how many here would say, Pastor Carl, I, I want this hope. I want this hope that's rooted in truth. I'm realizing that I don't know Jesus, that where I'm at with my eternity would be I would not be found in him. I would not be invited into this everlasting kingdom that you're speaking of, but I want to. Tonight, I choose to surrender my life to Jesus. If that's you, I just wonder how many are here. Just by slipping up your hand would say that. Pastor Carl, I'm choosing to surrender my life to Jesus. Maybe you've done this before. Thank you. I see a hand. Or maybe this is something that for you it's the first time or you've done it before. It doesn't matter. What matters is that heart. There's often times that we stumble as we go through life and we, we turn our back on God. We have defiance against him and he's inviting you back in tonight. Is there anybody else here that would say, Pastor Carl, thank you. I see a couple of hands. I want to know my sins forgiven. There's a few hands that went up in this place and in just a moment, we're all going to pray together, prayer that leads to that relationship. But for those of you that raised your hands, tonight I want you to, before you leave, connect with the leader and tell them about this choice you've made, and they'll take it one step further, help you in prayer, and guide you in those next steps. But for us, let's join together in this. Jesus, thank you that you are truth, that in Scripture you told us that you are the way, the truth, and the life. God, I accept that. I'm confessing now that you are Lord. I believe it in my heart, and I choose to live for you. Forgive me of my sins. And God, help me to walk with you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. If you raised your hand and you, you prayed that genuinely or if you wanted to raise your hand and didn't, but you prayed that, that is the beginning of that relationship. And before you leave here tonight, I can't stress how important it is. Connect with a the leader. They want to help you in those next steps. We want to help you guys with that. And for the rest of us here, what I want to do is as we wind down, we've got a little bit of time, I want to give you some moments to reflect.